All right, guys, um, good afternoon. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. And um, we will be starting in a minute. Just a quick, a few more students to admit into the class. Right. If you can just please put your, your speaker on mute, please, because the, record, um, the session is gonna be recorded. Right. Um, can you all hear me? Just confirm that the audio is is perfect. Loud and clear. Lovely. Thank you. So um, this week we will look at overview of project file menu and foundation scheduling. Um, last week we defined the projects and developed an understanding of what qualifies as a project. We then considered project constraints and built an understanding around how they interact with each other, especially with uh, project time. Next, we looked at scheduling and work breakdown structure dependencies and concluded with an understanding of logical relationships between project um, activities. Um, in today's training session, we'll have an overview of the project file menu. We look at the tabs in the backstage file menu and describe what they are used for. Recall that the menus hold the tools that you use for developing and managing your programs. Today, today's session will be primarily an overview of the tools, the details of how they are used uh, will be demonstrated through subsequent scheduled sessions. Um, in the second part of this training, we will start developing a program for enabling works and substructure. Uh, we'll use a case study of a project tagged ANV block H. I uh, anticipate we may be about 20 minutes past our usual time frame in today's session. The learning outcomes will be number one, understand the project file menu and how to navigate them. Uh, we will understand the tools, the key tools in Power Project um, file menu for scheduling and program management. We'll understand the sequence for build, for enabling works and substructure. And we will learn how to program the detailed activities of enabling works and substructure. The file menu is often described um, as the backstage of the Power Project interface. It consists of several tools. For example, save ours, as you see on the screen. Um, you use the save as tab as the backstage view to save projects with a different file name using either the standard Power Project format or a different file format. Um, I will just quickly demonstrate that, but I'm trying to load master power projects. In the interim while that load, I will quickly run through the open tab. You use the open tab. You use the open tab of the backstage view to open projects. And the delete, you can delete a project if your access rights allow you to do so. Note that you cannot recover a project once you have deleted it though. Uh, so be careful not to delete a project by accident. So I'm going to pause briefly to demonstrate these first um, three tabs. So um, I will open this program for, as an example. I hope you guys can see my screen. You can, can you just confirm if you can see a Power Project screen? Yes, 
that's your conclusion. Thank you. So, yes. on the on the menu, you have the file there. Okay. So when you click on the file, this is the interface that you will see. And like I said earlier, you use your savers to save a new file. You know, um, if say even if you have an existing file and you want to save with a different name, you can use your savers. Um, and then if you have a, a program that's already saved in your computer and you want to open it, you can use the open tab there. Um, if you want to close, you can close. If you want to delete, you can as well delete a file. Like I said, be careful when you have to delete. Now, um, if I want to save the existing program I have open here, don't forget I have got a program open here. Um, if I want to save with a different name, the current name is Site Setup and Substructure. You can see it there at the top. Um, if I click Savers, then it brings me to this interface that allows me to select the directory where I want to save it. Um, I can click on Browse. Um, a pop-up um, window comes up. And I can select that, for instance, and I call it Rev1, and I click on Save. So once I save, the project name changes from what it was previously to um, Rev, uh, the Rev1 of that file name. So if I come back to File, System is just slightly slow. So you can see there that the size setup and substructure is Rev1. Now what you have there at the top is um, um, a property name. However, if you can see that the actual name there on that directory list there is showing as substructure Rev1. Now if I want to delete this particular one, if I click delete, and I select the rev one of that same program which I've just saved, and I hit delete, then that program goes. So what you have remaining there, so it's gonna ask that question. Um, that is the error check. This will permanently delete the project or baseline. All data will be lost. So if you click OK, then it deletes it from so you can see now that particular program is gone completely. So if I go back to my, inter, uh, my, my Explorer where I had it saved originally, uh, let me just click on Browse, for example. I think that should take me there. You can see that the Rev1 of that program is now completely gone from that um, directory. So I'm just going to op open that program once more. as a reference program for this session. Right. Now let's look at the other tabs. So we'll come back to file and you will see on the file there that there are other tools. For instance, you have the new, the print activation help. Now let's look at the new. You use the new tab of the backstage view to create power projects projects. So if you want to create a new project entirely, then you can use the new tab. Then if you want to print in PDF, you can then use the, um, the print tool. Now, um, you use the print tab uh, to print from the current view. Um, when you click on the print, for instance, a, a small um, pop-up comes up, which displays uh, different buttons that you can use to set your display, how you want your program to look like when it comes out in print. Now, 
The details of how to print and how to configure your print options will be discussed in a different session. So it won't be covered in detail this, this week. Now let's just quickly have a quick look at the new and the print um, on the program. So if I click on new, you can see there are different templates that you can use to create a new program. So if you select construction template, for instance, you select browse, and let's assume I call that Rev1. It's a completely new pro program I want to create, by the way. So Rev1, and I want that same name to be my short name. So I'm just gonna copy that and paste that there as well. The four, you can select the client, who, who you are doing the program for, if that's what you want. Um, who is creating the program is what goes in there. You can see my name is shown there. Um, the start of the project, which is the start of the first activity, is what shows in that cell. Um, if you want to password it, you can create a password and put a password there right away. But in this particular one, we won't be creating any password. So I'll just click on create. So once you do that, you can see a blank new program has been created and you can then start creating your activities, you know, on the, in the program. Okay. Now let's get back to the screen. The other two following options or tabs are the activation and help. Now you use the, activ um, the activation tab to view the status of your power project license at any time. If you have not yet reactivated your power project, the number of days left in the trial period before you must activate power projects are displayed. So I will again demonstrate that shortly. Then um, the help, you use the help um, tab of the backstage view to assess help on using power project. Um, for the explanation of this field will be shown in the next few slides. Now let's quickly go to demonstrate um, these two um, tabs on the program. So again, we go back to fire. If you click on activation there, Okay, I think there's one more thing I should have shown that we have not shown. Before I go into activation, let me quickly show you the print. So say you want to print, um, let me select this one here. So say you want to print this particular program, you click on print. You have that preview, okay? Now you see there's a print now, if you just want to print without checking your, um, your settings, if you, if you feel you're confident with the setting and you just want to print, you can print directly with the print now. However, if you want to manage the settings and control what, how you want it to print, then you click on print options. So your print options will bring this dialog box. There's the output tab, details tab, scaling, and appearance, okay? So like I said earlier, um, the detail of how to configure this print dialog will be discussed in a different session. And of course, we'll be looking at the full preview as well and looking at how to use that in that same session. Now, back to activation. So if you want to look at your activation, you can see the detail of that activation there. The version you are currently operating with, just Sorry, can I chip in a word, please? Um, there will be a time to um, to contribute on this, just for the sake of the recording. Thank you. Yeah. So the serial number uh, and the product key. Okay. 
So um, then that is on the power project. If, you, if your license is BIM compliant, you know, you can see your power project BIM add-on is licensed. So if yours is not licensed, you, you won't have that option there. So what is BIM is building information modeling is where it's an add-on on as the power project that allow you to, to do your um, 4D uh, planning. That is a quick help uh, link there for, to help you activate your software. Then the help, like I said, um, there are different links. I think I've shown you this to you before. There, there are different links there which you can use um, to help yourself and improve your knowledge, uh, which, are, which is currently built in, into the software by Lecosoft. So um, <clears throat> we'll run through some of these uh, various links and what they can do for you in a short moment from now. So back to the slide. Now, um, this slide details the the help and what you know and the explanation. So I, I implore you to explore these tools once you have your Astar Power Project um, installed. Now, the help. You see, so when you click on this link. It displays the Power Project help on um, Internet Explorer or perhaps um, your Google, as the case may be. It depends on the default um, browser you have on your machine. There's the Beam help. Um, when you click on this link, it displays the Power Project Beam help, like I said before. The EV Reporter help. Um, that's when you, once you click, you know, just so basically all of these various links triggers. Um, the support you can get from Elecosoft on how to to use the various tools, you know, as covered in all of that, those um, help links. So um, it's a very good resource place for you to to get acquainted with. Um, I use them. For instance, what I've just put here now was an extract from, you know, um, the help uh, link on the Astar Power project. Right, now um, let's go move on to other things. So we have the beam. Um, the beam. The beam tab is used to configure the building information modeling or 4D planning. Um, I'll, again, I'll demonstrate that shortly. And then you have the properties. Now, um, the properties tab of the backstage view uh, is used to maintain some high level information um, about your portfolio project that is currently active. Um, a, a thumbnail view of the active project is also displayed along with a button, you know, that you can use to access more detailed information about the active project. Um, you, you also use this tab to define users, passwords, and to uh, specify what, um, what certain users' uh, access rights, you know, are maintained, you know. So um, we'll be demonstrating that shortly. Again, we'll go back to the Astar Power project. So let's start with Beam. So if you click on Beam, um, that's what you get. But this is where you configure, you um, upload your IFC model. Uh, the, the, the training for 4D modeling, modeling is not covered in this uh, training. So but I think if you want, once you're settled in and you want to improve your knowledge on 4D model, it's something we can package as a training. But um, this is where you do your 4D modeling uh, import of IFC models. So, but again, just trying to show you the interface so you understand what that can do. Um, but the, the other bit is the properties there. And this summary page on the properties basically gives you the high level information. Um, as you see, um, Okay, well, I'll, I'll come back to that because all of these things here are just a summary of what you get when you go into the advanced um, properties. So the, when you click on the advanced properties, you see um, the property dialog box comes up, uh, which basically details information of the project. Now, um, uh, we go back to the slide where I would then explain all of these fields to you and what they represent.
Right. So, like I said earlier, when you click on that advanced properties, it should come, it should show this particular dialog box on your top right corner. Um, and you can see there's a properties tab and a field tab, but I'll just give you a quick summary of what this is. Now, all, all of this is I'm explaining to you um, I, is just for your information, just to, for you to understand that these futures are, uh, are, in, are actually in Power Project and you can use them. Now, you could change your name. Let's assume at the point when you saved your project, you have, um, you saved with a different name and you want to modify that name. You could actually, um, modify that name under the name field there. Um, I've left the screen here so that just for when you're looking through the video, you can reference the description of, you know, um, some of these various fields. Now, the short name, again, you, you can modify as well. The four, I think we've touched on that briefly. Um, that is the client who you are doing the program for, uh, who is developing the program. The start date is the date of the very first activity on the on the program, and the finish date is the date of the last activity. Now, in some instances, you want to um, have an imposed start date. The imposed start date, regardless of, for instance, you can see the start date on this particular project is the 26th of July, 21. But I have triggered an imposed start date, which is one day earlier than that start date. So um, where then you then have the 25th of, um, of July. Now be careful, be careful because if you trigger an imposed start date, what happens is where you then have activities happening um, earlier than this 25th of July, see an activity is then programmed to happen in August, uh, sorry, not August, in April. What you would find is, that April date will never stick against that activity because that activity will get pushed to the 25th of July. So it's just something you need to keep an eye on when you are, um, you are doing your scheduling. Um, if, if your system is, if your, if your program is misbehaving and you can't get activities to, to stay where you've kept them, it's very likely you have triggered an imposed start date or finish date. Now, the imposed you can't have both imposed start and imposed finish date. So the same explanation for the start, you could apply on the finish. You, you may want to impose a finish date on your project. Now, this also picks the overall duration um, of your program. So everything I've done on that program, which I, I, I was showing you, will show here in terms of the overall duration. The unit I'm using in terms of measurement, which is the default, is the elapsed weeks. So you can see, um, EW there means elapsed week. If it was just a week, you would just see W, okay? So, um, right, so you then have date zero. Now, um, do, 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 do. let me just quickly go to the next slide. I think that would detail some more explanations um, on this. So you can see on the next slide there, uh, the date zero, uh, the date at which you want unit numbering of any elapsed weeks or work units to, to be displayed on your data zone. Now, I'll quickly take you back to the program. Now, I think, was it two weeks ago or last week when I was showing you a, a Sunday program, I was telling you about the data zone and I told you about this particular um, week numbering. Now, you will see here that my week numbering is starting in August here, okay? starting in August, um, that is where my week one starts from. So if I want my week one to coincide with the, the, the start, the site position key milestone, then all I need to do is to right click on that date zone, click on properties, um, that is one way to do it. Um, then you come to your dates and scales, there you can then select the fourth, sorry, um, the 4th of October. So I need to go to October. So you select the 4th of October, which is a Monday. Okay, so um, you can apply that. So once you apply, um, what you will find is that um, your week numbering automatically changes from um, where it was in August to October. Now this is very crucial when you are planning or monitoring your projects because most site managers or management will want to know what current week number we are in. 
um, in, in the program or the project timeline. Now, that is, is crucial for your communicating of the program timeline. For instance, if you want to reference when the main work will start uh, against that timeline, you would say that that main work is starting in week 23, you know, um, this assumes that your date zero starts with your site possession, um, site setup activities and en enabling works falling afterward. But um, if, for instance, you are saying that your, your start of main works is your date zero, then all of these other dates line or week numbering here will be negative, okay? So, but it's all relative, depends on what the, um, the contract looks like or what the how the contract is uh, is constructed now that i mean we'll be having more of this discussion in subsequent trainings now let's go back to the slide so um, that that's your date zero there uh, currently on this particular snapshot i have here is showing the 25th of of july which is sort of um, coinciding with that imposed start date now <clears throat> in terms of the uh the progress method so the progress method, uh, you, you choose, so this progress method applies to your summary bar or your, your, your expanded or hammock task. So um, if, let me, let me just show you <clears throat> what I, I mean by that. So if I go back to my program um, and I trigger, let me just trigger a progress view there. Okay, so progress view, just a minute. Ignore the base, there's no baseline on this, but I mean, I can easily quickly do one. Uh, baseline manager, just to demonstrate this, um, this example. Sorry, I'm gonna copy that. So I'm gonna create new baseline and I'm gonna paste that there. Uh, I'm gonna embed it, gonna click next, continue. Um, yep, next and finish. So <clears throat> um, there'll be more on baseline later. Uh, this is just to demonstrate what I want to show you. So what the baseline does is just, it creates a copy of your program um, and save it. So against that baseline, you now you now basically compare your performance against that mirror of your program. So um, so now let's select a progress date. I'm not sure exactly what's showing there, but let me just quickly confirm that here sorry the computer is slightly slow this afternoon i'm not sure what's the problem but well, let's just be patient with it okay so um again some of the things i'm doing may not make any sense to you at this stage but just be patient and follow me okay now let's create a progress drop line there and call it <clears throat> progress 01. I'm gonna change the date to, let's assume that progress happened last Friday, 30th of, of um, July. <coughs> I'm just gonna change that um, size to somewhere around one, two. Okay, I'm gonna close this. Okay, now um, for the benefit of what I want to do, I'm going to come back to my prepare view and I'm going to move that start date to so I'm going to change my impose start date on this program to somewhere around the first week in July. 
So I'm going to come to file. Like I said, I'm just demonstrating some of these things to you now. So impose that date there. I'm going to move it to July the 5th. And I'll make the date zero July the 5th as well. Okay. Now let's go back. Um, let me just confirm what this is saying again, the date line. So I'm going to change that to July the 5th. And then apply. Now, um, I'm going to then move these to that date um, for the benefits. Okay, let me just reschedule and see if that will move everything. Um, none. Perfect. So that moved everything. Now you can see, um, let me select. Oh, this stuff is hiding my, sorry, just a minute. So my progress timeline is pro progress 01 there. Okay, so progress 01. Now you can see how that progress drop line wraps around. Now let's go back to our jagged progress view. <clears throat> Okay, so I need to make a few changes on my baseline because I changed my base, I affected my baseline when it was still in October start. So again, I'll go back to my project, project baseline and select the baseline and just merge. There's no need to create a new one in this instance. Okay, so that's done. So again, back to our progress view. So what you will find is we're saying that on line three, the side possession should be, should have happened 100%. Um, don't think that baseline worked. No, it didn't work. Sorry, I need to do it again. So that baseline did not work. I think my selections were wrong. So again, I'll merge. Next. So it says selected tasks, so it should be all tasks in the current view and it should be a full update. So next and finish. Right, so I'll come back here then. So you'll see that your planned complete is saying that you should be 92%, you know, on your summary bar. Let's assume this is deemed 100% as well. And that is 70%. Um, and that is 60%. So what you would find is on your summary bar on the site setup, you can see that there is an equivalent cumulative <clears throat> position on percentages against the summary. So now you must be careful how you manage these numbers. So what I was going to show you was how these numbers behave against your summary bar, your hammock and your expanded bars depends on the setting you have um, here. 
So it depends on the setting you have. So let's get to properties, advanced properties. On your progress method. So there are several methods there. Um, there is the cost, if you are dealing with cost, cost approximate. So there's duration, duration approximate, effort, effort approximate, none. If you don't want, if, I, if you select none, um, nothing is going to be shown there, I think. Um, sorry, let me just confirm that again. So we've selected none. So you can see that though we've entered progress already and it's, it's basically recalculated that, um, but you can see that your progress drop line is, is not shown to have cut across, you know, that bar. So that's telling you that this, if you enter any further progress, that will not behave the way it should behave. Now, like I said, there are several other ones. Um, there's overall, overall approximate. Now the intent is just, to show you some of these things and so, so that you are conversant with them. Um, let me close and let's go back to the, the screen. So it's a lot of information here really that we cannot do justice to it in one go. And I don't expect uh, at your stage for you to know every detail of it, but it's just a pointer for you. So you understand that these things are there and you need to keep an eye on them. Now, for the sake of time, let's move on to other business. So there are other, other um, parameters there, the progress date, which we've discussed. So um, the report date as well. So we have the, the percent complete, use calculated overall percent weight, so all of those, please go back, go into your, your, your help menu and you can check for the properties for logical dependencies and it will give you all the detail. But I've shown this here, like I've said before, I've shown these things here so you can read through them later and I'll be happy to take questions um, in the next training session. Um, there are more important things I want us to talk about today, but I just want you guys to, be fa to familiarize yourselves with these um, settings. Okay, now let's move on to the next item. So, uh, like I said previously, this view just summarizes, it's an extract of some of those things you saw in that advanced dialog box, okay? Then you have the import and export. So on the import and export, basically allows you to bring a program from um, Primavera P6, um, and you can also export Primavera P6. Um, you can also import from Microsoft Project and you can, you can export to Microsoft Project. So the same thing with CSV. CSV is similar to um, an Excel template. So you can do that as well. Um, and then you can export to HTML. So HTML is something, it's like your web-based browser, you know, so you can also export <clears throat> a file that can be viewed over the internet over the web browser. Now, um, be careful though, when you are exporting or importing because the, the logical settings and dependencies on Power Project is not always the same as you have in Microsoft Project or Primavera P6. So you may need to effect a few changes um, along the way. Um, we have the Site Progress Mobile. Um, so on the Site Progress Mobile, the, the SPM is used to configure, it's, a, it's an app that is used to configure um, reporting or to take project reports. Um, the SPM is an app, like I said, it's for project reporting. And what you do with the app is it allows you to capture progress data. You just like a normal phone app on your tablet, you can plug percentages against the activities. But before you can use it, you need to first upload the program into SPM. Um, and then you can then use your phone where you're working through site to capture those data. Once the data goes in there, you then upload into the cloud. Then you can download on your computer when you get back to your desk. We're not, we're not going to be um, going into those details in this training, but just to let you know what that does. Then you have the, I think I've discussed the import and export already. 
The other one is the options, which we'll consider shortly. Now, this option, again, I'm just trying to show you guys that it is there. Um, and with the options, uh, it's a tool where you manage your preferences, basically. Um, but for the explanation of this, we, we can't treat this in this session. It's going to be a, a different session entirely to look at those preferences when you are much, when you've gone further into uh, the training, because these are very advanced um, settings. So you need to be very familiar with the interface. This particular interface and the other one I was showing you earlier, there are things which you need to be able to do when you are much advanced into the training. So um, the last bit is the exit. So when you use the exit, what you are basically doing is you are telling the computer, can you please shut down Power Project for me? You know, so that's basically what you are doing um, at that time. So if I go back to the program, for instance, um, and I come to file, and I click on exit. So it's going to say, um, you have effected changes. Do I want to save it? Yes. Another change. I'm going to say yes to that saving before it closes it finally. So it just behave like your normal application, really, uh, where you, if you're typing in Word and you want to shut down Word and it says, OK, you, we notice you've made these changes. Uh, do you want to save it? So you can see it shuts down my, my power projects completely. So be careful how you use um, the exit, um, because if you click on the exit, what it's just going to do is close down power project completely. Right now, um, I know this is the most boring part of the of the training, but we will be going into some very interesting bits uh, shortly. And uh, move on to the now we're going to the more practical bit of the training now. Now everything I was saying previously was more um, too, was too theoretical because I'm just showing you some tabs and all that, so it may look a bit boring. But it's important we understand um, those tabs. Now what I was hoping to do was because the, the the menu of the power project is a lot. So what I'm what the strategy I'm adopting for the training is to take one menu at a time um, and sort of run with it. So we'll, we'll do some menu bits, understand some of the tools, then we do some practical bits. So it's sort of um, run run side by side each order, you know. So Oh, okay. Just remember, I shut down after power project. I was wondering why it's taking so long to load. So that, that's that's the sort of thing I'm hoping to do. So you can see today I've just looked at file menu, and uh, just it's one of the very boring part of the menu, really, because it doesn't really um, involve a lot. Now let me just okay, it's back on. Just a minute. So you can see that. Um, there's a file, there's home, view, projects, allocation, beam, and format. Now, each of these menu will be looking at. And honestly, if you look at the home menu alone, you can't cover everything in one training session. So we may take part of it halfway in, in one training session, then we go into some more practical build technology and build process training. So that's what I'm hoping we do. So today, we're just looking at um, file. Uh, try to as much as possible just cover everything but it, it may seem a bit boring but it just for you to have a feel and understanding of what is there i don't expect you guys to know the detail and integrity of it now but what what it is with knowledge is it may look like you don't understand now but by the time you start interacting with the software that knowledge will start coming back to you that oh yeah ruben said this well you can go back to the program or the videos and then you can say okay yeah what did he say in this in this regard you know so that's basically what I'm trying to, to, to help achieve here. Now, um, let's get back to the, the more practical bit. Now we'll be looking at foundation scheduling. And as far as foundation scheduling is concerned, we'll be looking at a typical substructure sequence, which is based on pile foundation. And that foundation should follow, um, that sequence should follow the piling mat, piling, crane base, core base, pile caps, ground slab, including below um, slab drainages and services, uh, services connections. So that's the sort of flow you will see um, in any typical um, 
sequence for a foundation. Now, um, this is the case study. Uh, I, I think I mentioned something about case study for you guys some time ago. Um, one of the case studies we, you'll be using is this particular case study. Um, and what you have on the screen is a 3D architectural impression of the case study. The case study is, um, I, I call it ANV blockage. It is an eight and 11 story block of flats comprising of two cores. So you see the tall story there, yeah, that was the eight, uh, uh, 11 story, and that's the eight story, okay? Um, and then we say it's comprised of two cores. Now a core refer to the access from below ground level to or uh, below ground level or ground level to the top level of any part of the building. So um, if you're accessing this this core here, you, you go in from this door there, and then you use a stair core or a lift. That stair core lift takes you through from the ground floor to each floor till you get to the last floor there. The same thing on this one, you access the entrance, I believe from here. And then once you enter, it takes you you use the stair core or the, the lift, you know, to each floor or to up to the last floor. So that's what a core is. In some instances, you may have a communal um, access between two cores. In some instances, you may not even have. I think on this particular project, there was no interconnectivity in terms of the living area between this core and this core. So if even though it looks like one single project, this is an independent building on its own as well as that is an independent building on its own, okay? So um, a core, like I said, would comprise of a, stair a staircase, a lift shaft, a riser service to, um, a riser shaft, which takes all the services to the, the, the various flats on the core. Um, and then for this particular project, the facade solution uh, is majorly brick cladding, windows, cutting wall in on the ground and part first floor. You can see when you say cutting wall, you see that, that bit there, all of those, they are cutting wall in. Uh, you see on this particular elevation here, those are glasses. So cutting wall in refer majorly to, you know, glass-like material cladding, okay? Um, then there are inset balconies uh, or recessed balconies. So those are balconies that are, uh, that are not outside the building elevation compared to these other ones here which are projecting balconies which are hanging out you know of the building so there are two whenever you're talking about balconies always think in the sense of inset balconies and projecting balconies you can see here as well look at those ones those are winter gardens so they are also balconies anyway so these are all um while this one is using the steel balustrade this one is using glass balustrade there um so you can see those are all balconies balconies there they are all inset. Um, this other one is, is a corridor um, there. Uh, again, on this, on this elevation here, you can see those are inset balconies, inset balconies there. Uh, but all these ones on these elevations here are projecting balconies, okay? Um, the roof, the roof is um, a flat roof on the 10th floor. So, um, in core two and the, um, Second floor, which is that one on core one, and then the, the the seventh floor as well. So you can see there's a roof there, there's a roof there, and a roof there. And these are all flat roofs. Okay, these edges you call, you see here they are referred to as parapets on the roof. Then um, you can also see that um, you have the overrun on the service shaft and the lift shaft. So you can see those those boxes there. Those are the overruns from the elevations. If you're, if you're looking at a building and you look at the roof, you can easily note where the, 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 the lift is coming from or is located in the building. Like this one here, the lift is somewhere there. Um, on this one, the lift is at the midpoint there. So just something you need to keep an eye on. Uh, externally, uh, the project has both soft and hard landscaping solution. Uh, the next slide you see is the 3D structural impression. Basically, I've skinned out all the facade and you're now left with the, the bones. So this is it's an RC frame, as you will see. The RC frame is standing on a piled foundation. On this elevation here, you can see there's a sheet-like 
material. That sheet is referred to as the pi, uh, a sheet piling. Now you use a sheet, a shift piling if there is a high elevation um, of soil that could easily collapse into the excavated area. So you use that sheet piling to hold, you know, the, the soil in place so that by the time you are excavating inside that area, there's no, um, the, the, no, no soil is collapsing on because it's a health and safety issue. So whenever you're designing for projects, you're looking at the fact that what does the elevation looks like? What does the land topography look like? Is there a sort of a high and low? If there's a high um, area, then you want to protect that area at the point where you are excavating the lower area. Because if you just start excavating and you don't protect it, what you find is there will be a collapse and it could lead to people dying, you know? So just something you need to keep, um, an eye on. Now, in terms of the structure, as I said, it's, a, it's an RC frame um, and it's partly in situ and partly prefab. The, the slab, now when I say the slab, the ground, this, the, each floor slab, see those flat horizontal slabs there for each floor, they are, they are in situ poor, but the columns and part shear wall were all prefabricated and brought to site to install. Okay. Um, now, in terms of the program, so the attached is a summary of the, of the sequence and logic and duration of a typical enabling works and substructure works. So you can see there, site possession, the holding, we've discussed this previously, the OASIS unit, which is your welfare unit. Then once this is installed, you jump into the next stage, which is services disconnection, if it is required. Because like I said, you don't want to keep services live on site when you're working, it's dangerous. You need to first disconnect from the mains. Then this one doesn't allow for any demo demolition. So if there was demolition, then that follows before you even start talking about the main infrastructure. So, but if there's no demolition, that can then link straight away into the preceding activity there. So you have the new drainage connections, the m and &E runs, which whenever you hear the word m and &E runs, it's main runs, you're referring to gas water, electric, and sometimes you have attenuation tank, then you have um, all your data cables, okay? Then um, most often than none, you want to build your road network to a base cost tarmac so that you have a dry surface for your construction equipment to, to work on. Then once you finish all that, um, you can then commence your, uh, your piling mat, your piling, then you go into doing your core and crane base, including the, um, the pile caps. Then you go into your ground floor slabs and drainage works. Now there'll be more on this. Uh, we'll just uh, go to the next slide. Like I said previously, the whole idea is to balance the, the actual software training with practical knowledge of the, the build process. Now, as you would see from left to right on this particular slide, um, pictures one, two, and three, they show the drainage services installation on the road. So you can see all these connections here, you know. Um, so this is where it started. This is where, you know, more of the um, pipes have been installed. Then as it's complete installed, then you have the, the backfill. So you're backfilling, you know, those pipes and connection. Now, once it is fully backfilled, um, picture four then shows so picture four and five actually, then shows the road uh, built up to base cost tarmac. So you can see here on this one, you can see that black tarmac on the road. Below that ground, that tarmac are drainages and other services, including gas, electric, you know, that, uh, that are required to have been installed there. So um, yeah, so you need to have all of that installed very early on before the main works would start. Um, if you do have any questions, please just take a note of them. We'll answer all of them at the end of the, the session. Now, um, your, your first task for this week will be an outline of the benefit. You need to outline the benefit of uh, the piling mat um, and determine the depth of its installation. So I'll email that to you guys um, after today's um, session. Now, the, the building I showed you, the project case study I showed you earlier, this is the floor, um, the foundation plan. So you can see the foundation plan there. Um, a foundation plan is a plan view drawing. Um, 
in section showing the location and size of footings, piers or piles, columns, foundation walls, and supporting beams. So if you zoom into this, you can see these dots, dots. Those are the piles. See these round dots there? Those are the piles that needs to be installed. So you can actually use this drawing to count how many piles are required to be installed on this uh, particular uh, project. You see this bit here, this round bit here, that is where the crane base is. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, piles to be installed for that crane base. Okay, so um, that's just something you need to note. Then um, you can see all these rectangular points there. Those are the columns. Those are the columns position uh, for the building, those structure. Like, let me just go back slightly. <clears throat> One more slide, I think. No. So you see, uh, where can I use, which one can I use? So you see this particular one here, can you see my mouse move? That is the column. See that, that, that wall there, that RC wall there, that's a column going all the way up, straight up like that. So you can see that column is resting on a pile cap there. Okay, look at this other one here. That's a column going all the way up, resting on a pile cap. That's another column. Okay, so you can see all these piles, one, two, three. That's what I was showing you as a round figure. Look at that um, crane base I was telling you about, I was showing you earlier. So you can see that about eight, eight piles, you know, on that um, is it hexagonal uh, shape pie, uh, uh, crane base. So that's what is depicted in that drawing I was showing you. So each of these columns, they, they are shown like a rectangle, you know, sitting on the pile cap. So you see all these boxes. You see there, those are the pile caps. So if I'm saying pile caps, that's what I'm referring to. If I'm talking about piles, these are the, the these horizontal bits going into the ground. So the ground bits, the, the all of these ones up all, up to this ground floor slab, the underside of these ground floor slabs, these are all um, below ground. They are the substructure works like I, I, I was telling you about. So the, 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 the scheduling we're looking at today is all the substructure work, you know, when you put your piles, your pile caps up onto the underside of this, um, this um, what I'll refer to as the ground floor slab, okay? Then you see this big shaft here, that is the core. That's the core, the core base, you see that? So that's the core base for this particular core one. Then at the midpoint there, there's another big shaft there. It's not shown clearly in this diagram. There's a big shaft there coming all the way down, sitting there. So you can see this big pile cap here. That is the core two, you know, base. So where you're going to have the stair core uh, because of the heavy weight of the stairs and then the lift, all of that needs to be, need to be sat on a concentration of piles uh, with a heavy pile cap on it. So just for emphasis, because it's important you guys understand these bits. I hope what I'm showing you guys is making sense. Please, if it is, just confirm. Um, one, or one or two persons can just confirm for me that it's making some sense. Oh, yes. Okay. Right. So, like I was saying, you see those small, small circular dots? Those are the pile locations. The mid, the midpoint rectangular bits. Those are the columns, you know, uh, columns. So you see this bit here. That is where the core is. That is the core one. Um, but you can see all the concentration of piles in that core. There's a lot of piles there. Then you come here again. You see here, that is core two. You know, another concentration of of uh, of piles there. Then the another concentration of piles on the on the on the on the um, the crane base, you know. So it, it just you need to just understand when looking at a foundation drawing, you can see clearly what what the building is going to look like in terms of when it start going up, you know. So you don't nobody needs to tell you, oh, that's where the stair core is going to be. That's where the stair core is going to be. That's the lift. You can see the box there with the X. Because that's the lift. That's where the lift will start. Here again, that's the lift there. 
that's the lift there okay so let's go on to the next slide or even before that i think there's something i need to quickly point at now when, when you are planning for scheduling the substructure works um, the foundation plan should be divided in poor areas okay i think i did mention that when i was looking at the work breakdown structure in another session in previous session so a typical poor area size is around 450 to 500 square meters however it is not restricted to this quantity as it could be lesser depending on the layout of the building footprint so um, in the attached for instance on this one you can see there's where you have p p that's that that is referring to poor so that's poor one poor two poor three poor four each of these pores are actually less than 450 square meters so even though the standard is 450 square meter where you can't achieve 450 for obvious reasons either because of the building layout then you can do lesser uh, square meterage okay now um on this particular one you can see that there's a bit more detail uh, you can see for instance on the crane base um the, the the program shows the detailed breakdown of activities for each key stage of work for installing the pie caps and ground beams so that's what you're looking at at the moment um post pile installation so after you've installed your pile um i thought there was something i wanted to show you guys but i think i've missed it let me go slightly back i wanted to show you guys um, a video so i think now there's no need to do that um where i was showing you the enabling works and services let me just carry this window and put here and then i'll play this video for you briefly So you can see how a pile is actually installed. It's a very short video. I think it will be very beneficial for, for you guys. Okay, so I will I'll forward this link to you guys later. I'm not sure why it's um it's not playing the way I wanted it to play. So, but that video there will explain in detail exactly how the um, the piling works, and it's very very useful. Okay, now um, back to the the details. So, as I was saying, once that piling is done and the piling has been installed, what you then find is um, you, you you then need to uh, you then need to localize the, uh, the reduced dig level to be done around the pile cap. To expose the pile, the pies to the right level as per the design. So you can see the very first activity there in line 11 says reduce level dig to underside of. So this is an instance of a crane, um, but it's still the same thing really, underside of the crane base. Then once you reduce, you then crop and trim pile to design cut off level. You blind, um, you blind the the base and. Um, when we say blind the base, what you are basically doing is you are putting mortar, you know, on the soil, you know. So um, you're putting mortar on the soil just to ensure that you know the you're you're separating the chemical activities on the soil from all the things you want to install on top of it. Okay, then. Um, you put your your river. You install your river. You know this rebars will form a continuous chain or linkage for upward installation of other elements to ensure that there is continuum in the transfer of the building load required to be carried by each installed pile. Um, once the piles are trimmed, um, the blinding to the pile cap base is done. So basically, blinding is um, like I said, it's like mortar or cement. You know um that you basically put on the soil okay um so i'm just checking through to pick the key elements there because of our time now 
besides the the blinding you know you then put your riba the riba is is a, a connection of rods you know that is required and the whole essence of the riba is to ensure that um, the pile cap is at the right level of strength and that it helps to distribute the load uniformly you know like i said don't forget the essence of the foundation is to carry the load from the structure down to the ground um, and then once this is complete you install your edge short train and back fill you know where services will be required to penetrate the pile caps um, or the cream base and on, or you don't need, need services across cream base really so then you know you need to install the, those those pop-ups or the connections at that stage before you now pour the concrete now um, the, the, the described sequence is generally the same if you are doing the crane base, if you are doing the pile caps, you know, so it's, as you can see, it's almost the same. The only few things there, I think line 14 is the bit that is slightly off because you need to put the, um, the crane anchors, you know, you need to install it as well. But for the pile caps, you don't need to in install any crane anchors, you know, as it were. So, now let, let's look at some videos, uh, not videos, pictures, so that you can uh, put what I've just described in context. Now you can see on the vid on the pictures there that um, on pictures one and two, you can see the piles. Those are the piles that were installed, you know, and each of these piles have about four ribbers penetrating the piles. Now what you need to do is to excavate to relative level as per design. Then you now cut the piles and expose all the starter bars or ribbers. You expose them. These ribbers, what they do is they form the connection for continuous um, transfer of load across the building. You know, so that's what is required. So you call all these starter bars. Um, so once you've cut it to the right level, then like I said, you blind. You can see that you pour concrete. In this instance, sand has been poured on top of the concrete and on the mortar that was, that was poured there. Then you now put your, your reinforcement. You can see the reinforcement cage there that has been put and tied with the this this ribbers or starter bars that are coming off from the, the pile. So then once you do that, you now put on this four here, um, picture four, you now put your short train so the short train is what all your form work is what gives is what keeps the the cement that will be poured inside the shape it needs to have you know um and ensure that it's not mixed with the soil outside of the area you want to pour the the cement now you can see that there's a service connection there as well so where there are services connection you can see there's one here as well you must ensure you put in the pipe before you pour your concrete Otherwise, after pouring your concrete, you can't go and start breaking those piles, those pile caps uh, to pass your, your duct. So any ducting that needs to happen must happen before you pour your, your concrete. So um, that's basically what it is. So when you see backfill, you know, then you pour. So in this picture, there's no concrete poured in this instance yet. But ideally, after this is done, you now pour concrete on this pile cap. And that's basically what a pile cap is. Now let's look at the next one. Um, on this one, this is for the ground beam. Um, you can see for again from left to right, uh, there's a localized dig around where we want to install the beam, you know. Um, and then there's blinding, there's a blinding, there, there's a gas membrane installed. You see that, that, um, that, material there that is put on the ground. So that's a gas membrane. Um, so on top of it, the, you, know, you, install, you know, install your your rebar cage again. You can see the, the, the cage built up there. You know, put your rebar cage. So you can see again, there are services passing through these rebars. You know, so if there are services to go through them, please ensure they are installed. Um, then you then put your, again on, on slide, on picture two, you can see that your formwork is there. And then you've now backfilled against that formwork before you now pour your concrete. Okay. So now note. Now what is a ground beam? A beam is a is a is is a connection between two pile heads, two or more pile heads. So when you want to connect, you want to do a connection between two or more pile heads, then you must do a beam. You know there. So that's basically what it is. And that beam 
uh, must connect in a horizontal way. And basically it helps to distribute the load across the, um, the building. So you can see that the concrete is poured. You can see the curing of the concrete there. This one is a closer bit of, you can see when it's now fully cured, how it's looking like, you know. So that's basically what you would get, you know, um, when you're doing a ground beam. So most often when you're doing a pile cap, you will say pile caps are ground beams because often, most often than not, you need to connect two or more um, pile heads, okay? Now let's go to the other bit. So the ground floor slab. Now the ground floor slab, after you've done your pile caps and you've done your, your, ground, your, 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 your ground beams, then the next thing is to then do your ground floor slab. So that's the horizontal flat plates, you know, that you now pour. So again, the, the, the sequence of activity is the same as you will see there. So um, it's very similar to what we've discussed before. Uh, but the only thing I wanted to note is in the way this is structured, this is grouped in poor areas. You can see, so you, you do, you repeat the same activities per poor area. And you can see that um, the, um, each prepare and level existing pile mat is driving succeeding activities in the next poor area. So you can see line 52 there, which is prepare and level existing pile mat is driving the next one. So you have a delay of about uh, a lag of one week, one day there before the next poor activities can start and you can see how it drives everything in that sequence. So if you can get that sequence right and you're able to, for instance, if you can master this sequence of activities and you can demonstrate it and talk about them in an interview environment, you're in a very good position. Now, what I will do after this training is to send you a PDF copy, which should be your second task of these detailed activities. I want you guys to master it and I want you guys to develop it in an Asta Power project and share that with your mentors, okay? We're almost there. Now, in talking about the ground floor slab, you, you can see from, um, from left to right again, the top left corner, you can see how the river on the ground floor slab is being um, installed. You can see all the services uh, pop-ups coming out of it as well. Um, on the bottom left corner, you can see the short train, an example of short train, you know, um, around the edge short train around the installed river. Now, at the top right corner, you can see the concrete being poured. Uh, the, when you pour concrete, there are all these air bubbles. Uh, so you use this particular device to extract the air bubbles and ensure that there's uniformity um, in the concrete pour across the slab. And you can see the finish, you know, product there at this bottom picture. So that's what you get as a ground floor slab. Now, below this ground floor slab, like we've said before, are your pile caps and your piles, you see. So, and of course the ground beams as well. So, but this is, this is the ultimate objective what we want to achieve. So you can see the starter bars coming up. So these starter bars are the location where the, 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 the columns will now need to sit in, in progressive uh, build up from floor to floor, you know. So we'll be having a further discussion around that in the next session when we'll talk about superstructure. So um, between five to seven days after the concrete is poured, um, the superstructure activities will begin because the concrete will have been cured, you know, so we'll have more on, on this in subsequent um, training. Now, uh, that, that's, that ends today's session. And I hope we've been able to balance between the, 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 the use of the software and of course, the practical demonstration of how things are done on site. Now, what have we learned? Uh, we, we, we now know about the tabs in the file menu and um, how to navigate them and how they can help improve our scheduling and program management. And then we've also looked at enabling works. We've looked at substructure scheduling. Uh, and we now understand the sequence of activities, how these crucial work uh, stages um, so we've looked at the, the sequence of activities for these crucial work stages and how to generate a robust program for them. So these are some of the things we've, we've captured today. Um, and don't be 
don't be deceived. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot to take in in one go. It's a lot to learn. It's a lot to talk about by myself as well. So I've tried as much as I can to sort of capture the crucial bits into one piece. But I'm very confident that if you can understand and master some of the things I've shown you guys today, you'll be in a good position. Um, so on that note, um, I want to ask if there's any question and uh, thank you for listening and being patient with me in today's session.